you, Martin. The chief is back. Uh, hey, George, come on, bring it up, bring it up. Let him, let him, let him hang in there. Uh, Back. Don't worry, don't worry. Everything's under control. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Here, Martin, please. I ain't spot. You're right. We gotta do it. Just gotta do it. I just feel like it. Come on, just a little honky tonk. Yeah, I'm still playing. Okay, man. Ennies, Ennies, Ennies. I've got to get organized here. All right. Well, for all of you uh, that uh, frantically wrote in asking for information on how to grow worms, I'm amazed that the... If we really we really tapped the mother load out there of anxiety. Oh, yes, everybody today is looking for, for uh, a way to ensure himself a continual and, and unimpeachable source of income. But the... Uh, I last week suggested that uh, a business which I was once in, and uh, yeah, I, I must say I'm sorry I left it because it was a great business. Uh, I was once in the worm business, although this, let's face it, show business itself is a can of worms. So I suppose I'm still in the worm business in one way or another. But uh, I was selling real worms. I'm talking about grubs and uh, earthworms, night crawlers. You know, here on the east coast they call them night walkers. Yeah, they are. They're called night walkers. They're called the night. Now, if you don't know what a night cr no, a night walker is not something that Jack Palance played. No, 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 no. This is a, a worm. You prefer just plain worm. And uh, for those of you, I'll give you a tip on how to spot a night crawler in your lawn. Now, uh, first of all, the night crawler is very, very sensitive to pressure on the earth. See, he lives in the earth, so naturally, it's just like you, you know. If somebody's running around in a ceiling, you're aware of it. That's because you live in a house. Well, a night crawler, if, if you go running out to the yard wearing your clod hoppers and uh, your mountain climbing shoes, you'll never catch a night crawler. Because the minute he feels that earth tremble under your 120 pounds of gristle, uh, he will automatically dig so deep in the ground you'll never get him. So what you do is if you want to catch night crawlers some night, kid, you ought to try it tonight. Especially on a, on a night that has a little element of dampness in it. If the, if the, and in the spring especially. Well, the moon has some effect. But uh, not that much. Not that much. Now, I'm going to suggest what you do. Take your ordinary flashlight. Now, be careful. But the, the worm is highly sensitive to light. He will not stand still for light. And if you go out there with a flashlight, it's all over. You go out, the light, bam, zap, all of them go out. Now, now what does the night crawler do? Well, the night crawler at night, why he's called the night crawler, is that he comes above ground. Well, a lot of people don't know this. You know it, but a lot of them don't. And uh, this, this uh, worm comes up above ground and literally uh, uh, crawls over the landscape looking for its food. And incidentally, it also is looking for moisture, interestingly enough. And so this thing comes along, you'll see them on the surface. Now, the night crawler is a much larger worm than your conventional, what you would call a earthworm, or a, you know, it looks the same, but it's a different, different type, it's big. And man, I'll tell you, there's nothing like a night crawler to madden a smallmouth bass. I mean, a night crawler uh, thrown under the proper lily pad in some cases is actually dangerous. You've got to jump back because that smallmouth bass is going to come out with blood in his eye. There's something about a night crawler that makes a smallmouth bass go to totally ape. That also includes the uh, yellow perch. It includes the uh, common or green variety of pickerel. It includes also uh, what is called the, uh, the Midwestern crappie, better known as the rock bass in certain areas. These things are all addicted to night crawlers, including the, uh, the, the rainbow and the brown trout, if you want to go a little esoteric on us. Yes, although catching a rainbow trout on uh, night crawlers is really not playing the game. You agree? 
It's not playing the game. I mean, you can do it, but it's not playing the game. I mean, that's like that's literally like fishing with a hand grenade. I mean, uh, the, no, because the, the, the trout has a mystique about it. The rainbow and the brown have a certain mystique and should, uh, it's like an art form. The, it's, it, the fish itself is an art form. And it's an elegant fish. And the fish should only be fished for with the proper uh, fly tackle of fly equipment and uh, artificial lures. Now, if you're just a plain, ordinary Jersey type slob, you could just jump right in the pool and run around and grab them by the behind. Uh, that kind of fishing. But that, of course, is the same kind of fishing that the Kodiak bear does. And if you've got the same kind of mentality, go right at it, buddy. I heard a great line the other day. This guy, this guy got in an argument with another guy, see, in, the, in, a, in a hardware store. These two really, you know, thick neck type guys, you know, with the corduroy hats. And one guy says, you know what trouble with you? And the other guy says, what, what? And the, and the first one says, you ought, you, ought, you ought to put a ring in your nose. Which I thought was kind of nice. They ought to put a ring in your nose. Well, <laughs> lead your on. So, uh, nevertheless, the trout we will not uh, include in this group, although the trout does enjoy, uh, particularly after dinner, it enjoys a nice, a nice night crawler as a sort of an aperitif. But uh, nevertheless, uh, if you wish to catch a night crawler, here's the way one does it. Or if you wish to observe the night crawler, now you may live uh, uh, someplace where you have a, a if you have a lawn. Uh, you, you take your shoes off, for starters, and in your stocking feet, when it's nice and dark, like, say, about 11 o'clock at night, and there's a little dew out there on the grass, you go quietly out there with your flashlight. However, take a piece of red cellophane right over the lens completely. It works, man. I'll tell you. He, if for some reason or other, the, the, the fish or the, the nightcrawler is not able to see red Light, red light, it's colorblind apparently. And uh, you can understand this, living under a Jersey lawn all that time. So uh, what you do is just put a piece of red cellophane completely over the lens and usually just pull it down over it and then put a piece of rubber band around it and then shine your light through that thing. And boy, man, I'll tell you, no, no night crawler can possibly see this. So then when you go sneaking out and you just look around with that red beam of light, you are going to see more action in your lawn than you ever believed. And you probably didn't even know this was going on out there in your lawn. Well, 15, 20 minutes, you just pick up those worms as quick as you can grab them. And by the way, do it fast, because a night crawler on the surface is fast, man. They move. Yes, they do. If you don't think a, a, a worm is a, is a quick mover, believe me, it's fast. Once he gets halfway into that, into that hole and he's gone, there's no way you can get him out. So move fast and fill up a can of... Um, take just you know just take a chock full of nuts, a one pound coffee can or something, and just throw the throw the worms in there, and move fast, and then about an hour later do it again. You'll find that the second shift has come on, and uh, and by the by the end of uh, two or three trips like that, you might have yourself ten dollars worth of worms. You'd be surprised how much night crawlers go for. Night crawlers go for like uh, fifty cents for a dozen, roughly. Yes, they do. And because uh, night crawlers are not easy to come by, and uh, a fisherman, you don't dig for night crawlers. See, that's one of the problems, and that's why they're harder to get. So, uh, if you if you go out, pick yourself up some worms. Then all you have to do, then after you've picked up these worms, and you uh, got them in this can, you uh, stick a little stick out in the yard, and a little sign on it says "Night Crawlers Inquire Within," and then stand back. Two months later, you'll be living on a Riviera. And uh, you'll be known as the Nightcrawler King of West Plainfield. And uh, it's a very, a very, very good thing to have. And you've got a little thing in your sock there. In fact, I'll tell you, I got a letter from a, from, a, uh, from a leading educator in the state of Connecticut. In fact, he, he was in one of the universities up there, and he said, Shepard, I'm getting damn sick and tired with what's happening at this rat hole. He's referring to the leading university where he is, he is a leading educator. And he says, I have been looking for something that is really exciting to do for years. And when you described the fantastic excitement and deep inner satisfaction of going into the worm business, I knew right then that my calling was there before me. It's like the priesthood. Uh, worm people, it's a calling. And once you hear the knocking on the door, that knocking, and once you see your first night crawler, that is uh, is attempting to evade you. Once you've made your first capture, 
There's just no turning back. I can tell you, ever since that time when I was in the Nightcrawler business, I was only in it for about two years when I was about 10 or 11. To this day, to this day, I think of myself basically as a worm merchant. And uh, I, I, anyone asks me, you know, if you woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, say, what do you do, Shepard? I'm a worm man. Then that's what I'd say, see. It's only later, you know, that you build up all these other things. Like Johnny Carson sees himself as an S.O. pump jockey because that's where he worked for years. So, uh, yeah, well, that's right. You know, I, I, I've wondered uh, if, if any, any guy, you know, it's, uh, made it uh, in this world, wouldn't it be great for all of us to go back just once to play a guest shot? <laughs> the first job you ever had, you know, to go back and play a guest shot. Like, like wouldn't it be great if, say, President Ford, for example, you know, when President Ford uh, was, uh, was a kid, he worked in this lunchroom for a long time. Yeah, he was a... He was a, a counter boy at a lunchroom, and he also was a waiter. You know, just a, a diner is what it was, see? And he worked there a couple of years. And I think he worked his way through school partly doing that. So wouldn't it be fantastic if one day this guy, you know, sitting down at Red's Diner and the phone rings, and he says, Who? Who's on the phone? Who? The White House? What do you mean? You mean the White Castle? Don't know what a hamburgers are? We don't want a White Castle. The White House? You mean a White Washington? What, uh, what do they want with me? Who? Who's on the line? Ford. Yeah, we used to have him work here. What do you want to know, buddy? You want to, uh, some kind of a... I'm not going to give nobody no uh, recommendations. He's been too long. Who? He wants to come out. Ford. He wants to do a guest shot? When? Oh, no. No way. No way. We're closed on Wednesday. Okay, tell him uh, Tuesday night he'll take Ernie's shift, right? Right. Take the number. Yeah, Ernie's still here. Tell him Ernie says hello. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll see you then. Okay, Prez, I'll see you then. Uh, you're taking any shift next Tuesday. Okay, I'll write you on the board, right. Okay, yeah, we still got your apron. Yeah, yeah, we don't throw nothing away here. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> Can you imagine President Ford playing a guest shot at the, <laughs> at the diner? <laughs> I'm not going to tip uh, the hand here uh, totally on, on uh, how to raise worms because uh, I... Uh, I think it's such a such a wide open field. No, I'm not kidding. Uh, in fact, I quoted the other day uh, from one of the financial magazines. Three kids went into the worm business uh, out in the southwestern part of the United States three years ago, and now their sales total roughly 1.7 million dollars per year. Did you know that the number one American participation sport is fishing? Well, not many people know that. They would think it's tennis. It is not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> they don't. But the thing is, they don't put fishing much on television unless it's Boog Powell fishes for the golden orangutan off the coast of Peru. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, not real fishing is ever put on television. You never see a couple of guys sitting around here with cane poles fishing for bullheads, which is what really goes on. And, but nevertheless, fishing is growing fantastically due to the fact that I don't know whether you've been recently in a supermarket and looked at the fish prices. Oh, brother. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, fish, uh, fish has become so popular in America in the last 10 years. Fish is tremendously popular. In fact, the most popular restaurants these days are generally seafood restaurants. And uh, it's become so tremendously popular that fish itself has skyrocketed. And so you get on, you know, what used to be uh, uh, like 79 cents a pound, something like that, uh, for whiting or haddock or something like that. Now it's, you know, the, they think nothing of a little sign that says 279 a pound or 379. And you got to take the bones and the scales with it. So, uh, <laughs> so, well, that's right. But so fishing has become very popular. So a guy sitting around there. Uh, he he pulls out, the, he's fishing a while there, and he, he winds up landing himself a couple of uh, two or three pound uh, smallmouth bass. He's got himself like uh, ten dollars worth of worth of fish right there. Now, I mean, outside of the fact that it's also a sport, we're getting some information here from the uh, from the information center here. So hold on, yes, what is it uh, you wish to say here? Uh, three sixty nine a quarter pound. That's that's about it in your neighborhood. Yes. You're an engineer, of course. Yes, that's about it. Uh, it is. It's about 379 a quarter pound in some places. So naturally, you know, uh, 
uh, you, you're sitting there, and, and, and some of the fish that people are discovering, you see, is another thing. For example, uh, the, the catfish, a true delicacy, the catfish properly prepared and properly treated is one of nature's noble creatures. Now, if you want to know how to fix a catfish to begin with, a catfish is sometimes called a bullhead in certain parts of the country. You know, it's a catfish. Now, the catfish is, first of all, skinned. One does not scale a catfish. He has skin. So how you skin a catfish? Simple. That's right. You take a, you take a pair of pliers, and the, the fish is just generally, you just run a, a very sharp knife right down what could be called the dorsal, right down the fin, right from the top, zip like that. And then you just take the corners with it with a pair of pliers. Of course, you, I assume you've already cleaned the fish. You just, you just zip that skin, and it comes right back. You pair of good pliers, it just comes right off. Hmm? No, no, you just take it right off. It just zips right off. Now, at that point, what do you do with the fish? Well, there's several things. You can fillet them, but uh, properly done, uh, you don't even have to do that. Because this fish doesn't have bones in the sense that, uh, say, a conventional fish does. Different kind of skeleton. So the fish is put in salt water overnight. And uh, by the next morning, you have got yourself something that's worth doing, I'll tell you. And uh, especially if it's fixed, when, you, when you're, when you're uh, broiling it or frying this fish, uh, it is also fried simultaneously with, with a, a strip of very lean bacon. And wow, it's a real good fish. So, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't like to, you know, to sit here and uh, just to wave my expertise around like that. No, no, I just hate to do it, but uh, uh, it's, so the, the worming business has become a big business because uh, of many factors, not the least of which people are into fish these days. Uh, for a long time, it was considered that the only fit food for a human being was a Big Mac or a quarter pounder with beef, uh, with a quarter pounder with cheese there. Well, no, this is, this is a very, this is a very strongly held myth in many areas of, of the country. Uh, occasionally they will settle for a Burger King or possibly a Big Mac or possibly even a uh, Big Boy. Uh, but uh, other than that, all other types of food is largely unpalatable to that type. Uh, have you ever tried to foist off uh, Alaskan crab legs on a person that really seriously likes Big Macs? He's offended. Uh, no way, it's impossible. It's like trying to, uh, it's like trying to pass off a, uh, you know, it's like trying to give a novel by Joseph Conrad to a guy that really seriously reads TV Guide. Uh, there are people who study TV Guide, you know, they really do. You know, Inside Lauren Green, three-part article, a think piece. Oh, it's controversial. Hmm. What he said to Flipper at the Academy Awards dinner, all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, anyway, I, I'm getting back to to jobs. I, I just say that uh, many of us out uh, walking around have had jobs in the past which we don't often discuss. And I will discuss now one of the jobs which I do not often discuss uh, because it was such a hellish time. And I will tell you what it was. I'm, I'm a kid saying I'm out of work, right? It's spring and I'm looking around for a job and uh, nothing happens. And so uh, I decided, hell with the working, I'm going to play tennis. And uh, so about the middle of June, it was obvious I wasn't going to get a job. And even though I messed around, tried to get a job, <laughs> I had these working papers. What a joke. So I went, uh, I went uh, down to the employment agency. Nothing happened. And about the first part of July, on one, one pivotal weekend, well, actually, it was a pivotal Monday, a phone call came in from this agency, this employee, state employment agency. It says, hello? Is Mr. Shepard there? Well, yeah, that's my old man. See, and if, uh, he picks up the phone. He says, yeah, what do you want? And they said, this is the state employment agency. We, the old man says, I'm not looking for a job. What the, what the hell are you doing? And at that point, you know, there's a lot of yelling back and forth, and they finally got me on the phone. And I said, yes, hello. And the man says, is this Gene Shepard? And I said, yes, it is. Uh, you ready to go to work Monday? Next Monday, this time? I says, yes, I am. He says, well, you know, uh, you're going to have to be on time. Get down to the office here, and we'll give you the, uh, the slip and the uh, authorization, and you go to work where we tell Kay, right? I said, yeah, gee, yeah, all excited. He didn't tell me who it was. So that day I ran down to the office there, and they gave me a slip. Now, 
uh, if you've ever been to a state employment agency, you know that there's always long lines of people and there's all kinds of very official people sitting at gray desks. Yes, they're, they're, they're stamping things. They have these roll card uh, file systems and they're always looking stuff up and you have to have uh, mimeograph forms filled out. So I was all excited. See, I go down there and uh, they told me what desk to ask for, desk L4 or something. So I waited in line with all these other guys, and I finally got to the front of the line, and uh, the man says, uh, next, next, and so I jumped up, and I ran over, and I sat down, and he said, uh, all right, uh, your name, please, I said, Shepard, oh, yes, yes, of course, you're on the list here, yes, yes, okay, and he looks through his file cabinet, and he gives me a card where I'm supposed to go, again, it did not say actually what the business was, it just had an address, uh, and, and it, it says, underneath it, it says, ask for Ernie, Ask for Ernie. Well, you know, that, that kind of sounds good, see? So I I, uh, I had to wait till the next Monday when my job was supposed to start. It was supposed to start at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Ask for Ernie. So I, uh, I, you know, I was all excited getting a new job, as you always are. But I had no idea what the job was. Now, have you ever been hired to a job and you didn't know what the job was? Well, it's an exciting thing because you don't know what you're going to, you know, get into. It could be almost anything. You know, I could become a star overnight. Who knows? So uh, <laughs> that, that following Monday, I borrowed the old man's car. See, and the, where it was was way out of town. That's what was so curious. It, was a, it, was a, it would be like if, uh, if uh, you got the address and it said, uh, go to the corner of uh, New Brunswick and uh, US 1, something like that. You know, it's just a, it's, it was a, not an address like go to 422 Main Street. It was a, it was out on a highway. So I drove out there and I drove around a couple of times. And I couldn't see the business because it was just nothing on any of the corners. Just, it just came together, these two major highways. It was US 41, which you've probably heard of, and US 6. These two highways crossed. There's a tremendous intersection. Well, there's nothing around there, though. Just a couple of lights hanging in the middle and things warning, and no left turn, stuff like that. Well, I went over to this. The only thing that was there was a Standard Oil Station. So I drove over to Standard Oil Station. I said, listen, I, I think I got the wrong address. And uh, can you tell me where this is? And the guy looks at the card, and he looks at it, and he looks up at me, looks at the card again, and he turns around. I'm sitting in the car. See, I'm, looking, I'm asking for instructions. He turns around, and he hollers, hey, Ernie! Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> he said, hey, Ernie! Well, I, I, I realized then, at that point, that my job is in the Standard Oil Station. Well, let me tell you. So I, I, uh, I got out of the car, I parked the car, and I go into the, you know, the little gas station there, and there's this guy sitting there with a green jacket on, it's a Standard Oil, had one of these green hats on, had a Standard Oil insignia, you know, and Ernie's sitting there. And, uh, he says, uh, yeah, what do you want, kid? And I says, well, I was sent down, sir, Mr. Ernie. I was sent down uh, from the uh, state employment agency, and uh, they uh, here's my card. Oh, oh, you're the kid, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're big enough. Yeah, okay. Uh, I said, uh, turn around. Hey, Clifford, here's a kid. They sent a kid down, yeah. Clifford comes back from where the grease racks are, and he comes out, and they both stand and look at me. And one of them says, okay, kid. So he flips me a jacket. He reaches the back of him. He's got a, what is green, uh, you know, it's got a locker, and he takes the jacket, throws it out to me. And I got a green jacket on now. It's a standard oil. I got a hat, standard oil. And I said, what do I do? He says, well, he said, Cliff will show you around. And so Ernie goes back to reading this dirty magazine. Which, by the way, was the story of the entire time I spent there, Ernie, either reading dirty magazines or getting in his Hudson and driving off. There was a blonde that kept coming into the Standard Oil Station every day at 3, and Ernie would follow her home in his Hudson. They had a little thing going, and he would leave me around the station while he was gone. <laughs> or you'd be surprised at the rampant, uh, let's put it this way, the rampant erotic life that centers on a gas station. A lot of people don't know this. I think I'm probably the first person reporting it in the public media. But around every gas station swirls a cesspool of passion. Oh, you'd be surprised. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of side effects to working at the, at the local, uh, you know, being a local pump jockey. You'd be surprised. 
you get more offers you would ever believe. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Like for example, what a tip. I was I was working about an hour and a half, and the, and this car drives in, and I, I learned how to work the pump. See, and uh, you know how you work the pump. You you work the pump. You know, an electric pump, regular pump. See, but you learn how to do it. You reset the the, the cash marker and all that on the thing, and so this car drives in. I was working there about an hour and a half, and uh, the, the car drives in, and I see it's a Plymouth. She drives in. There's a girl. And she says, oh, fill it up. And I said, okay. She says, uh, hi, test, please. And I said, okay. So I said, pull up a little bit, will you? So she pulls up about uh, three feet and stops. And so I take the gas cap off and I start the pump going. See, it's ding, 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 going like that. And uh, I got about eight gallons in the thing. And she was pretty empty. See, it was, I, I figured it's going to 11, maybe. So it's going ding, 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 ding. I got about nine gallons now. And uh, now it's about 10 gallons, ding, 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 just crosses 11.5, ding, ding, 11.6, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to top it off now to get a, even $4, you know, you don't want to make change, see. So I just, the last square, then it's ding, 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 I finally get the last thing, and I walk around, I says, that'll be $4, please, you want me to check your oil? And she says, um, she's just so embarrassed, I just discovered that I don't have money curse with me. I Oh, am I embarrassed? And she looked up at me and her eyelashes, you know, I said, oh, you don't, you, you mean, you don't have any money? Well, of course, at that point, I had not come, you know, I had not come into contact with this little scene of being innocent. So I said, uh, oh, uh, gee, uh, um, uh, well, wait, I'll get, I'll get, uh, Mr. Ernie here. Uh, she said, oh, no, no, that's not necessary. She said, uh, I often run out of money in the gas station. I said, you do? Get it. So she says, what? I'll tell you what you do. She says, why don't you follow me home? And uh, it'll only be about a half an hour. And then you can come right back here. And I'm sure everything will be fine. I said, what? I mean, oh, well, I said, hey, Ernie. She said, no, no, don't, don't, don't tell Mr. Ernie. It's all right. He said, he'll understand. <laughs> Well, at that point, I began, the scales began to fall from my eyes. I began to see something. Uh, that life was not what I had imagined it to be. There's all kinds of things going on under the surface. And, uh, and, uh, hardly anything is what you think it is. Now, most people think working in a gas station is dull. Oh, let me tell you. Uh, one time I had a minister. I was there about uh, three days when it was Sunday, and I was running the whole thing by myself. See, Ernie used to take off. And he'd say, uh, hey, kid, uh, I'll be back about six. Uh, uh, just uh, just uh, handle a pump and uh, don't give any credit. I'd say, okay, all right, Ernie. And he'd go taking off. There I am running the whole thing. See, well, on a Sunday afternoon, we'd get these spurts of activity when uh, nothing would happen for about uh, an hour. And then all of a sudden, some guy would drive in, you know, with a gigantic white cab over engine. He wants 5,000 gallons of diesel. <laughs> and then right behind him, in comes a station wagon with 47 crying kids. They want 19 gallons of regular. They want me to change the oil. They want new antifreeze in the car, and they want a ring job. Uh, behind that comes five other cars all lined up, and the next thing I know, they're all over. And I'm running around there, you know, like a one-legged paper hanger, see? So finally, <laughs> here in the middle of all this, this car drives in this black Plymouth, and it's a, it's a, it's a reverend. He's got a, a collar, see? And uh, he drives in, and he says, uh, Son, I said, yes. He said, did you go to church today? And I said, you'd be surprised the stuff that happened. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff that happened. I said, I didn't have time. I'm working. What do you want? And he says, oh, well, I will have five gallons of regular, please. And I said, uh, very good. So I run around the back. I take the cap off. I stick the pump in. I start pouring the gas in. And, you know, ding, 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 ding. Now I'm running over to the station wagon, and I'm changing the water or the oil or something or trying to get them a lead back on a plug, and all the while, another guy ahead of him, his his radiator is blowing up, shh, all over the damn, you know, and I'm running back and forth trying to keep that guy from yelling. The truck driver's honking his horn, and, and the reverend then says, uh, son, would you please come over here? And I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. He hands me a track. He hands me a track. The track says, have you discovered the truth of life? Have you walked with your Savior? I said, wait a minute. I said, I don't have any time to read a track, sir. That'll be... Uh, let's see, that'll be 290. And he says, Ah, the work of the Lord is the work of all men. And I said, That'll be 290, sir. He says, Ah, yes, the work of the Lord is not thankful work. 
We work in the... I says, you mean? He says, yes, sir. And he drives out. You can't, you know, you can't call a local squad car to go and put the arm on the, on the minister, you know? He drives away. Well, so I run back in the office. I write down minister, $2.90, say. It was only three days later that I discovered he wasn't a minister at all. He was a guy that hit all the local gas stations and handed out tracks. So, <laughs> oh, you get used to all kinds of things. And then... Then, then the time of the time that I'm, 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 I'm waiting in there for, for business, it's all quiet and nice, and we got held up. Have you ever been held up? Oh, you, once you're held up, you know what it's like. I'm sitting in my little place with my little hat on. It's about 7 o'clock at night, and Ernie has gone down to, to, uh, to the local McDonald's, say, or something. You know, He's going down to get a hamburger. So I'm sitting in there. They waited, see. I'm sitting in there. The car pulls in. And uh, there's two guys, very ordinary-looking guys, sitting in the car. And I walk over to the car. The guy says, uh, oh, he said, uh, uh, give me uh, uh, eight gallons of regular. And I said, yes, sir. So I take the cap off, and I put the hose in the thing, and I start the pump going. And I start wandering around the back of the car. And he, he says, oh, would you check the oil? So I says, okay. So I raised the hood, and I hollered, uh, it'll take about a quart. What, what weight do you use? He says, oh, put in uh, 30 weight. And I said, the detergent or regular? He says, no, give me detergent. So I poured in a quart of 30 weight. And uh, I put the hood down, and I walk around ready to collect the dough. And he says, oh, listen, he says, have you got a Michigan map? I said, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I start to go back into the place, and he gets out of the car. He's coming, so I'll pick it up. He walks into the place with me, and I turn around with the Michigan map. I say, here's the Michigan map, sir, and uh, that'll be, uh, let's see, it's uh, 310 on a pump. Uh, let's see, uh, 60 cents for the oil. And uh, I turn around. He didn't say anything. <laughs> he didn't say what? You know how they always in the movies, they say, uh, you know, something? Nothing. He just got a gun. I didn't say nothing. I just went, ding, hit the thing, no sale. You know, register pops open. And I just back away. He reaches in, he takes it all out. He just looked around, looked at me again. I said, nothing. That's it. You got it all. And he just walked out, puts the gun in his pocket, casually gets in the car, starts it, and he drove away. Oh, by the way, one thing he did that was kind of nice before he drove away. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, told me I didn't have to clean his windshield. He says, don't bother with the windshield. He drove off. So you learn, you learn, uh, I think in the two weeks that I worked in the Standard Oil Station, and the only reason they hired me, I was I was replacing another guy for two weeks. See, that's why they wanted this kid, see? And after two weeks, I lived the rich, full life of the pump jockey. And I got to know the smell of alamite grease. I got to know what it's like to take a radiator cap off and... <laughs> blows up in your face. I got to know the sound of the, the deadbeat, the, 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 the squeaker. By the way, that's another type of guy, the squeaker. Yeah.